Welcome and thank you for joining us for the next presentation in our Animal Law CLE series. My name is Pamela Hart and I am the Assistant Dean and Executive Director of the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. Joining us today is Clinical Professor Kathy Hessler, Director of our Animal Law Clinic and the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. Also joining us is Amy Wilson, Fellow of our Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. Launched in 2016, our Aquatic Animal Law Initiative is one of the first to focus on questions that broadly relate to the legal protections of aquatic animals. Kathy and Amy will be sharing their expertise in this presentation on aquatic animals and the law, the troubled waters of aquaculture. Welcome to the Aquatic Animals and the Law, the Troubled Waters of Aquaculture CLE. Hi, everyone. So today we're just going to be skimming the surface on some very complicated issues. We hope to provide an introduction and highlight certain aspects for further research and discussion. First, we will provide an introduction into who aquatic animals are, some of the categories and uses of them. Next, we will highlight some of the scientific studies and research that is being done and developed in relation to aquatic animals, which is important in how we treat and regulate them. After that, we will provide a brief introduction to the practice of aquaculture, its growth, systems, and some of the issues that it raises. In part four, we will give an overview of some of the regulatory frameworks relating to aquatic animals and aquaculture in the USA and internationally. For our final part five, we will look at some of the positive and potentially negative developments happening in this space for further consideration. Given that some of the topics we are covering today are extremely broad, we are focusing only on certain aspects. We note that there are a number of additional factors and considerations that form part of these issues and the matters that are gonna be touched on today. Thus, our focus will be on aquaculture and we won't be delving into wild caught fishing, sports fishing, or even aquaculture for non-animals such as seaweed or algae or for other purposes such as fashion or medicine. In our analysis, we are also only focusing mostly on industrial scale and major aquaculture operations. And this should be compared with some of the smaller operations, artisanal and indigenous star systems, which are different and raise different considerations. So who we are, I'm Professor Kathy Hessler. I teach at the law school at Lewis and Clark in Portland, Oregon, and I direct the Animal Law Clinic and the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. And I am Amy P. Wilson. I am the fellow at the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative, and I assist with the Animal Law Clinic. And we can tell you very briefly about the mission of the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. We work to protect and promote the interests of aquatic animals in particular by advocating on their behalf through the legal system, promoting their value to the public by providing education about their cognitive, emotional, and physiological and psychological capacities. And we work to harmonize human, animal, and environmental interests. We're speaking to you from Portland, Oregon where we acknowledge the indigenous people on whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand, including the Multnomah, Taplamit, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. We know that land acknowledgements can be fraught, but feel they are important. And we think it's important to learn about respectful relationships with animals and the planet from these historical and present day communities. Great, so for part one, we believe it's important to give an introduction to who aquatic animals are. Most people tend to default to finfish or even think of some of the more charismatic species like dolphins, whales, or turtles. However, for the work that we do at Ally, when we refer to aquatic animals, we mean all different types of aquatic animals. On this slide, you will see some of the categories of these animals, which is by no means a complete list. It is important to consider all of these animals as animals, as it helps increase their visibility. Recognizing these animals is the very first step to granting them protection. Some people might be surprised to learn that corals are in fact animals. They may think of them more as a plant or even a rock. When we talk about aquatic animals, we mean fin fish, amphibians, echinoderms, mollusks, which include cephalopods, crustaceans, reptiles, marine mammals, including cetaceans and pinnipeds. As I already mentioned, nadaria, including corals, periphera, such as sponges, aquatic birds, and even the often forgotten aquatic insects and spiders. 
Within each of these categories are a huge amount of different species. Today, we'll be talking about aquatic animals broadly, but notably, not all of these animals are used in aquaculture. As a default, we might refer to fish to include all farmed aquatic animals. There are likely more than 2 million marine species. It's important to remember that we also do not only marine, mean marine species, we actually mean freshwater animals too. All of these animals have significant differences in terms of their biology, capacities, welfare needs, and other factors. We treat them similarly under the law, but only sometimes. Importantly, the law is not bound by biological realities. So for example, just because an animal has the capacity to suffer, it doesn't mean that the law protects this animal from suffering or even makes it a crime to cause such suffering. We'll highlight some more specific examples of this later on in our presentation. Before we get into the regulation and protection of aquatic animals, it is critical to understand the foundations. We need to try and see and understand them first before we can aim to protect them. We tend to offer much less protection to aquatic animals compared with terrestrial animals. But why do we do this? And why is it even important? While the invisibility is a really big problem, we literally can't see most of these animals and therefore they are unseen in our day-to-day -day lives. We lack interaction with them and because of that, we lack an understanding of them and tend to have less empathy for them. Thus, they are misunderstood, ignored, un unseen and underrepresented. They are the largest number of non-human animals impacted by us humans, other than potentially insects. And thus we treat them as an unlimited resource and we discount the value of the individuals. We tend to treat them as a means to other ends and they are abused and exploited. But they are sentient. They can experience pain, pleasure and have other capacities and Kathy's going to touch on some of these later. Yet they are not properly protected in our law, policy or by society. There is a significant gap and need for this legal protection. They must be valued, respected, and protected from harm. Importantly, we can touch on this, there are alternatives that are possible and growing for most of the uses for food, research, entertainment, medicine, jewelry, and the list goes on. So as a next step, how we use and classify aquatic animals greatly impacts on our treatment and use of them. We'll be focusing on aquatic animals used for food today but it should be understood that these animals are utilized and exploited in numerous amounts of ways. And they also categorize differently and that impacts on how we and the law treats them. On the slide, we have a bunch of different categories of these animals. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see even in your own mind that we categorize these animals differently. And because of that, they will receive different protection. So for example, threatened, vulnerable, endangered and protected species tend to receive more legal protection than others. Those used in entertainment might receive different protection from those that are used as worker animals, such as Navy dolphins. And then those that are used as research subjects perhaps receive even less protection. There are many, many more examples. And this is to just give an idea of some of the ways that these animals are used and how our categories affect them. So how is it that we are able to use and exploit animals in this way? It essentially comes down to their property status. The law treats non-human animals as things or legal objects. And this is the case in the vast majority of the world. This status means that humans can do many things that are considered cruel and inhumane and that they wouldn't similarly be allowed to do to say other human animals. Importantly, some jurisdictions have recognized that animals are sentient, which means that they have the ability to perceive and feel things in their own right. Many jurisdictions are slowly recognizing this within their legal systems, but animals still have the fundamental property status. There are many global efforts to improve this status to give them legal personhood. Uh, generally, these, focus, these efforts are focused on terrestrial animals, including mammals, and not really aquatic animals, although there have been some cases relating to whales. So as I mentioned, the property status is hugely problematic in an attempt to get better protection for aquatic animals, and in fact, animals more generally. And some of the consequences of this property status means that all animals are deemed to be owned. So this is either by individuals or corporations or even the government for wild animals. And ownership doesn't actually require responsible care. 
So owners have the ability to regulate all facets of those animals' lives. And they're not necessarily always required to protect them from harm either. And in fact, they can inflict harm themselves. These animals are not seen as self-owning. And this is similar to what we see with children who need guardians to assist them and represent their needs in court and in other scenarios. And it's also similar to other disfavored human populations. And thus animals are seen as a plentiful resource. They are designed to be used and they are useful and valuable only for human ends or enjoyment. So continuing on with this, they are not seen to have intrinsic value. The law does not know how to attribute value to animals without the human be benefit. And with no value, they have no protection and this forms the status and treatment. And as I mentioned, this can lead to abuse, neglect, cruelty, even extension and other welfare concerns, some of which we're going to highlight today. But as it relates to aquatic animals, it means in practice that trillions and trillions of them are killed every year. This background of how animals are seen in the law and in society is important and it frames how we deal with them, which is why we're spending a little time on it. It's also important to see how animals are treated and understood through science. And so we'll spend a little time on that as well. So most people my age learned when we were young that uh, fish couldn't feel pain. And this is not accurate. So we like this, uh, this statement that it's official. Scientists really do recognize that fish feel pain. And this information is getting out more broadly into the wider community beyond the scientific community and has applications and implications for the work that we do with all animals, but specifically in aquaculture as well. So what are the, the results of some of the studies that have come out with respect to aquatic animals? Here are just some of the examples that some aquatic animals have been found um, to, they've been found to be sentient, which means they can feel pain, but to have consciousness to be self-aware, to cooperate across species, to protect their young, to recognize humans, to have emotional responses and on and on. Again, what we were taught earlier was that these animals reacted instinctively and they didn't make conscious choices. They didn't have cognitive lives, emotional lives, psychological lives or abilities. This is turning out to be proven to be false. We don't have studies for each species yet um, but we do have all of these studies showing these elements are um, available, are proven for certain species. And so we think it raises a lot of really important questions. So just as a couple of examples about sort of the intentional actions that scientists have shown these animals can undertake. Cooperation is one of the, the capacities that animals have been shown. And so this is a slide showing a moray eel and a trout. These animals cooperatively hunt. So the eels can go into spaces that are small and narrow, spaces the trout couldn't go into, and flush out prey that they can both enjoy. And so this is a way that they both benefit from working together to get to meet their nutritional needs and, and move on with their lives. And it's intentional behavior. They know what they're doing. They know who to cooperate, cooperate with, when, where, and how. Another example is cleaner fish. You may have seen some of these examples. These are fish who eat um, the, the kinds of things that gather on other animals, that parasites, those kinds of things that are problematic for the host animal. So the cleaner fish choose to help out these other animals because they also enjoy eating the things that are on those animals. But they make really conscious choices. So just working together is a choice, but they make additional choices. So we, studies have shown that these animals would prefer not only to eat the parasites, but they would actually prefer to nip the skin and the tissue of the host animal themselves. But they don't do that when there are clients waiting, when there are other animals waiting to be cleaned, because if they do it in front of these other animals, those animals will go away. They're like, we don't wanna be bitten by you, thank you very much. But if there's no one around, they might actually nip some of these these host animals because it won't affect their ability to work with other animals in the future. So think about the cognitive processing that has to happen for these animals to make those kinds of choices. Another thing that folks used to say is, again, because it's instinctual, right? Whatever capacities these animals have, it just, it's just how they're hardwired, their biology is wired. 
and it, it makes sense for their survival. So we also know that cleaner fish can actually um, recognize humans and they actually can clean humans, right? So if there are humans down in the water, um, these fish will treat the humans in the way that they treat other fish, but they don't actually have a history of seeing humans, of recognizing them, of knowing where to look for parasites and that sort of thing, and yet they're able to conduct the same kinds of activities with respect to humans. So working across species in this way is not something that is explained by um, just instinctual behavior. Self-awareness is one of the tests that scientists use to measure human intelligence um, as well as animal intel other animal intelligence. And so the mirror test is one of the things that they use to identify an animal having self-awareness. And that's this concept that I recognize myself in the mirror as myself and not as another human being. And animals, some animals can do that as well. So this is just a few slides of a manta ray who had placed underneath him or her a dot and a mirror was put in the enclosure and the manta ray was able to swim under uh, up to the mirror and look at him or herself from all angles and then actually even notice the, where the dot was placed and try and figure out what was going on. So this was um, indicative that the manta ray understood him or herself as, as an individual, as their own individual and not as looking through a glass and seeing another manta ray. This is a test that sometimes even two-year-old humans can't pass. The cleaner fish that we were just talking about have also passed the mirror test more recently in 2019. Interestingly, after this happened, there was a call for changing the test. Some people indicated they thought, well, if cleaner fish can pass this test, maybe the test isn't strong enough. Many scientists have pushed back. And what we learned from this or what we take from this is that it makes sense that, that animals are self-aware because it's a helpful trait for survival. And so we anticipate more and more animals, aquatic and other, will be shown as passing, uh, passing this test in the future. A couple of other quick studies that have come out in the last couple of years. Cuttlefish, those are the, that's the photo on the upper right-hand side of the slide, has passed the Stanford Marshmallow Test. This is a test where someone is asked, if you want right now to have a marshmallow, you can have it. But if you wait for a little bit, you can have two marshmallows or more. And so this test measures patient self-control, decision-making, and the ability to manage delayed gratification. And cuttlefish have passed this test. So it's a pretty amazing capacity that, again, lots of people didn't think aquatic animals might have. And longevity is also something that people don't attribute to fish and other aquatic animals. Most people think goldfish, for instance, live very, very short lives naturally. And that's not the case. So what happens with our human involvement is we change what's a natural lifespan for these animals. And so just one example is this 81-year-old fish discovered in Australia. This is significantly old, even for other scientific um, research, but these animals can live quite a long time without human uh, interrupting their lives. So the other thing that we know about science um, is that we're, we get this information that's valuable about the capacities of these animals, but once we discover more of their capacities and more about them, we tend to also think about more ways we can use them. And that can be significantly problematic. Most people don't think of aquatic animals being used in research, but this is just an example, uh, one of those kinds of examples that horseshoe crabs are, are bled uh, for medical purposes. And one of the other things that we wanna talk about just in passing is that each of these kinds of activities has an impact on the wild setting. And so while we're not gonna talk about aquatic animals in research um, in any depth, and we're not gonna talk about the wild focus, we just want people to recognize that these things are happening. And when you take more of these animals out of the seas for research, and you're taking them out for food, it has a devastating impact on the entire ecosystem. So what do we know or what are we learning from this new science? So there's the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, which says that all mammals, including marine mammals, have consciousness um, and cephalopods as well. There is a scientific consensus that fish feel pain, and we think that will grow to include other species as well. We think, therefore, the precautionary principle should be used when we're considering using animals. And that is basically, if we think we're going to cause harm, we should stop and find another way to achieve that goal without causing harm or find ways to minimize or manage that harm. 
So this requires a shift in how we're approaching aquatic species, both in the social and the legal context, and causes us to reflect on what our duties are. Again, social duties and actual legal duties um, with respect to these animals. We think that we have enough data, scientific and other kind of data, that we should change our legal default to assume that all of these animals are sentient and deserving of protections unless science or something else can prove otherwise. We know that's a big ask and it's not likely to happen, but it's what we, we gather from the scientific information. And one example of how this new science informs our legal duties and responsibilities to all animals, including aquatic animals, is the situation with the, um, the idea of warm-blooded animals under the Animal Welfare Act. For those who are familiar with the act, you'll know that the framework of it was to protect warm-blooded animals initially. It's been refined somewhat since its initial, uh, that initial framing. But we've also, so we had this idea that under the law, we had some protections under the Animal Welfare Act for warm-blooded animals. And we thought that fish were not warm-blooded animals. We knew that there were some partially warm-blooded, including the salmon sharks, the billfish, and the bluefin tuna. But in 2015, we discovered a fully warm-blooded fish. So that changes things. It changes things scientifically, and it changes how that science informs the law. Because you could pause it now that, well, these animals should be protected under the Animal Welfare Act and not excluded under the category of fish because they should be included under the category of warm-blooded animals. That argument hasn't been made yet, but, but it gives you a sense of how law should respond to scientific information. Great, so let's get into part three, aquaculture. What is aquaculture? Well, there are many different definitions, but according to NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the USA, Aquaculture is the breeding, rearing, and harvesting of fish, shellfish, algae, and other organisms in all types of water environments. Aquaculture happens in different contexts, depending on the types of animals farmed, the jurisdiction, and various other factors. It happens both in freshwater and the marine context, and in water and also on land. There are fed systems and there are unfed systems, and Kathy will touch on some of these different types of systems shortly. In terms of the animals used, again, it really depends on a number of factors and differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But some examples of the animals used in aquaculture include finfish, such as salmon, trout, catfishes, carps, and tilapia, crustaceans, such as shrimps, prawns, and crabs, and mollusks, such as oysters, clams, and mussels. But it's important to note that this is always growing and increasing. Well, how much is it growing exactly? Quite tremendously. At least 527% increase in production between 1990 and 2018, which is quite staggering. In 2018, people consumed twice as much fish as they did in the 1960s. Fish sales totaled $401 billion in 2018, and more than half of that was from aquaculture. So looking at this slide, this is an extract from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, and they put together the State of the World's Fisheries and Aquaculture Report every couple of years. This slide is taken from the 2020 report, which utilizes data from 2018. Looking at the graph, you can see the difference in growth between aquaculture, or the farming of aquatic animals, and capture fisheries, where wild animals are actually caught from the wild, and this includes marine waters as well as inland waters. If you look at the graph, you can see that the capturies have sort of evened off over the years, whereas aquaculture continues to grow at an exponential rate. You will also see from the bottom there that a number of animals are excluded from these figures, including mammals, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and then even seaweeds and other aquatic plants. But why is it growing at such a rapid pace? Well, there's a number of different reasons. On the slide, we've attempted to put together some of these arguments that are in favor of aquaculture or what some of the benefits are that are claimed by proponents of the industry. These range from issues such as drop creation or the economic benefits to the fact that we need to produce a huge amount of protein to feed the world. And then compared with say terrestrial animal agriculture, there's less input protein required. It also has less freshwater and land requirements than terrestrial animal agriculture. 
In terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, the arguments are that it produces lower GHGs. And one of the main arguments is that it's actually a potentially healthy protein choice compared with some of these other foods. Then if you look at oysters, for example, they actually remove carbon from the atmosphere. So they say that's a positive as well. One of the key arguments we hear often is that this in fact aquaculture is sustainable and we'll touch on that in a little bit of detail. But it's important that it's also critical to consider how aquaculture compares with wild caught fishing. So let's take a look at some of the figures from the FAO report. So I'm not gonna read through all of these, but while we're going through them, one of the things I wanted to really highlight is if you look at the numbers there, it's referred to in millions of tons or tonnage. And when we think of the number of animals used, specifically aquatic animals, we are not able to ascertain the exact number of individual animals used. So compared to terrestrial animal agriculture, where we're able to say this many animals were utilized or killed for a particular year or time period, with aquatic animals, we simply have no idea. We refer to them in millions of tons, 96.4 million tons captured. I mean, that number is absolutely staggering. It's really hard to wrap your brain around how many animals that is. So estimates are that it's approximately one to three trillion finfish a year. But again, we don't really know. All we know is that it's increasing dramatically. And this is for food and for various other uses. And one of the other figures on the slide is the illegal unreported or unregulated fishing, which is IUU. And this obviously relates to wild capturies, but it is important in the aquacultural context too, as Kathy mentioned, because it implicates on the broader environment and the other considerations. So for the next, the next slide, we're looking at the worldwide figures, 178.5 million tons, again, millions of tons of animals. And there we can kind of see the differentiation between aquaculture and capture fisheries. Aquaculture continues to increase and wild fisheries kind of leveling off in some instances. Importantly, Asia accounts for 89% of aquaculture production. And why that's important is because a lot of the domestic countries are promoting their own industries and we'll see exactly how the USA is doing that a little bit later on. But how are these animals being utilized? Well, it's not just for human consumption. Importantly, these animals are used for other food to feed other animals. Some of them are fed to other fish. Some of them are fed to terrestrial animals. And then some of them are used for non-food purposes, such as fish meal or fish oil, or even vitamins, right? It's a billion dollar industry. There's a lot of monetary investment in it. There's a lot of jobs, a lot of human lives implicated. The whole sector is approximately worth $500 billion, which is obviously huge. And then one more figure I wanted to highlight from this report was the discard. And in the report, they mentioned that 35% of global harvest is lost or wasted, which is obviously over a third, meaning that the number of animals caught, of all the number of animals caught, a third of them are discarded. And this is either because they are the wrong animals or because of poor management or other factors. These numbers do not even take into account bycatch or a number of the other harmful impacts that these industries have on the environment and other, other animals. So the figures really are staggering if, you, if you're looking at them and it's increasing all the time. And so we should take a little bit of a look of how these systems actually operate. So again, we're not gonna be focusing on the wild caught fishing systems, we're just going to look at the aquaculture systems. And so sometimes we refer to these as factory farming um, in the water. And so what does that actually look like? So there are systems that can take place literally in the oceans in a marine environment, literally on land in factory settings, um, sometimes in a combination or nearby water. So we're just going to show you a few slides so you have a sense of what they look like. And obviously, people are using different systems depending on the species they are breeding for aquaculture. So some of the ocean systems are really quite, quite large and you can see how problematic it is for the mature animals. Obviously there's a lot more room when they're small, um, but when they grow to uh, market weight, it's called, this is what they may be experiencing uh, 24 seven. This is a large number of those kinds of open uh, offshore net pens. Uh, these are uh, some crabs, this is a sort of mix. It's not in the marine environment directly. It's in a freshwater um, environment. 
this is one of the things that people are thinking that they will do. They'll create some additional kinds of pens that are, are um, anchored to the ocean floor. Some of the land systems, some of them again are really um, adjacent to the water, right really on the water. Um, some are not uh, on the water, but are impacted or impacting, impacted by or impacting waterways. Some look very much like factories. I don't think most people would recognize this as actually um, animals being in these, these facilities and some truly indoor factory kinds of settings. So we have a lot of uh, different settings to be talking about with respect to the ecosystems. This is also something that we want to just sort of highlight that people think that this um, style of producing food might be clean, might be safe, um, and we uh, are suggesting that there's some significant problems that Amy will begin to talk about. Great. And some of the realities, unfortunately, in aquaculture are things like pollution. So on the slide, you see an example of a type of farm where there's a lot of pollution. And it can arise from multiple sources, some of which we're going to cover later on. Uh, but it's very important that these impact the environments around them, they impact the people that live around them, and it's not simply limited to the animals themselves that are living in these operations. They really have far-reaching impacts. So another issue experienced in aquaculture is deformities. This slide shows an example of a deformity in the spine of a trout, which could potentially have been caused by nitrate nitrogen levels. There's a number of other different types of deformities that also occur, and they're not uncommon, unfortunately. Again, yet another reality in aquaculture is that of diseases. These diseases vary, and they arise for a variety of reasons. But as with terrestrial animal agriculture, they are problematic because of the large number of animals that are kept in confined spaces. So diseases are obviously present, and they don't only impact on the animals themselves, but they also impact on the humans, firstly, that are working in these operations, but secondly, that are consuming them. So they present health factors too. The prevalence and problems with diseases are acknowledged by the industry itself. On the slide is a survey from 2017, which was from the shrimp aquacultural industry. And in the survey, diseases were listed as the top issue and challenge in the industry. So it's clear that this is not only well known, but it also affects their own production and is a matter of importance to them as well. I will also pause here to see that it's not just diseases on the slide that's mentioned. There are a number of other issues and challenges that are included on there, and some of which we're going to touch on in a little bit, such as antibiotics and chemicals. So another very important issue that affects the health and safety of aquaculture is the use of antibiotics. It's a very complicated area and it raises a lot of different policy and legal questions. Given the large number of animals kept and similar to terrestrial animal agriculture, animals tend to get sick and therefore antibiotics need to be used. So they're used to treat diseases caused by parasites, bacteria, but they're also used to sedate animals so that they can be handled. And then they even assist animals to spawn that wouldn't otherwise spawn in captivity. So obviously to do unnatural things. In fish science, the term drug is used to recognize more than just fish, fish medication. It also includes disinfectants, pesticides, herbicides, and biologics. These antibiotics are then ingested by the animals and then subsequently by the humans who eat them. And of course, there's consequences of that. So this slide shows some of the drugs or antibiotics that have been approved for use in aquaculture in the USA. And a full list can be found on the US Fish and Wildlife Services. But importantly, a recent study showed that there are a number of emerging diseases, at least 36 from the study, for which there are no FDA approved drugs or drugs in the approval pipeline. So there's really a large number of issues with this. There's a long process to get these drugs approved for use. It has to go through a lot of different processes, a lot of costs, 10 to 20 million to gain FDA approval. So it's a really high process, a long process, and it's something that really impacts on the aquacultural industry. Of course, it's necessary, right? Because there's some benefits for using uh, antibiotics if you're working in the industry. This slide highlights a few of the downsides and some of the upsides from 2002, which is non-exhaustive. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but one I did really wanna highlight is antibiotic resistance. 
And this happens when germs like bacteria and fungi develop the ability to do, defeat the drugs that are designed to kill them. This means that germs are not killed and they continue to grow. Thus, because so many drugs are used in animal agriculture and even aquaculture, after time they lose their efficiency. And according to the US Center for Disease Control, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest public health challenges of our time. Each year in the US, at least 2.8 million people get antibiotic resistant infection and more than 35,000 people die. And they've actually mentioned that fighting this is a public health priority that requires collaborative global approach across sectors. So again, when we're thinking of aquaculture and the industry and the use of antibiotics, we need to think of the broader knock-on impacts on society. And so in addition to those kinds of, of problems with aquaculture, we have a number of other issues that some people may or may not be familiar with. I think some folks are already aware of some of the environmental impacts of aquaculture, but aquaculture is often touted as a safer alternative and better for the environment as compared with capture fishing, fishing right, wild caught fishing. Um, and what we have found is that's not the case. So just a couple of examples, um, Atlantic Sapphire, uh, has a farm in Florida. It's a Norwegian, a Danish company that has a farm in Florida. And just recently, over the last few years, they've had some significant problems. They're trying to come sort of up to speed fully uh, as a member of the industry. But in March of 2021, 500,000 salmon were lost. Um, and in June of 2020, 200,000 fish, we think that they estimated about 400 tons, 62% of their total was lost. And so we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of animal lives. We're talking about economic loss. We're talking about some significant problems in our attempt to raise animals in a very, very unnatural setting. There are, as Amy said, additional concerns or worker concerns. So workers in that farm, have, the factory farm had been uh, rescued from tanks and hospitalized just uh, a month or two ago. And this company is moving to ramp up its production and hoping to produce over 100,000 tons annually by the year 2026. So it's a very, very large uh, production facility. We, we know that there are some environmental outputs from these facilities, right? They can't be completely contained and they aren't even trying to be completely contained. So the image that you see on this slide is, is blood being piped directly from a facility into the ocean. This is what it looks like. And there's very little regulation, which we'll talk about um, going forward. And so when we're thinking about the environmental impacts, we also think, of how, think about the economic costs. So the choice to invest economically in these systems um, has a lot of implications. And when we know that it costs 12 up to 12 times as much to raise farm salmon indoors as to catch them in the wild, it, it makes us stop and question whether these environmental costs are really worth it. We also know that there's no conversation um, engagement with organic farmers or indigenous farmers who are engaged in the same kinds of activities. Um, there's not a conversation about the climate impacts, at least not at, the, at high level conversations. And we also know that there have been lawsuits about false advertising. So these salmon that have been raised indoors and in factory farms have been um, claim to be sustainable and from Maine, for instance, and this impacts environmental policy and protection. There's further uh, impacts in the ecosystem and to consumers. So as Amy said, there's lots of other um, problems that relate to these kinds of facilities and their practices. So in addition to the antibiotics and the pharmaceuticals and the pesticides being used, so that's a welfare problem for the animals, it's a problem for the people who work in the facilities and the waste from all of these um, also go into our environment and that becomes an additional environmental problem. The fish waste itself, just as we know from terrestrial factory farms, when you concentrate animals in a small space, the waste becomes um, impossible to handle naturally. So it can't just dissipate in the wild appropriately and naturally, it overtakes the local environment in harmful ways. There are additional environmental problems like co copper sulfate that is used to treat the nets to keep algae off the nets that then again just leaches into the wild. Dry pellet feed and we could go on, there's lots and lots. We know that most wild caught fish have some contamination that's coming from these operations and other operations, other kinds of industrial oper operations in the oceans um, and in the freshwater environments, but we need to be thinking about that. 
when we know that more than 50% of US catfish are contaminated with dioxin, and that more than 50% of farmed cod are deformed, we have to really stop and think about these practices more seriously. We know that farmed salmon has the highest toxic load of any food that's tested, and that humans living near these fish farms have a higher incidence of disease related to water pollution. We know that it takes two to 10 pounds of wild caught salmon, um, or wild caught, excuse me, fish feed for every pound of farmed salmon. So we're not making choices that seem to make economic sense or making the best use of our resources. And we know that fishing, fishing, wild caught fishing is used to support aquaculture. And we have additional problems that we don't have a lot of time to talk about, including safe slavery and brutal treatment of the workers in those settings. And that taking away something we don't usually talk about, taking away fish from other sea life and small communities and businesses have negative impacts on them. And also has negative impact on the animals who would rely on those animals for food themselves. So, just a couple of other quick examples. Sea lice is something that occurs naturally, um, found across the globe, but in factory farm settings is a significant problem. And so they're trying to figure out ways to uh, deal with the problem of sea lice on the farmed animals. And in these aquaculture facilities, most of the animals are impacted. They've tried uh, pesticides, which is potentially problematic to treat food that people are gonna eat. They've tried other responses. And we talked about the cleaner ras fish earlier. And so because cleaner ras fish eat pests, eat pests um, they use them to clean uh, the salmon in the factory farm setting. So these animals are bred, confined, and used for pest control. And um, there's some problems, we'll talk about that in a minute. In the wild, we know that salmon are 73 times more likely to suffer lethal sea lice infestations in waters that are near these sea pens or in facilities um, than animals who are not near these. So we know that's a, that's a symptom, right, of, or an example, some evidence of the problem going beyond these facilities and affecting the wild animals. Um, we also know that just one fish farm can increase the incidence of salmon sea lice infestations in the wild up to 40 miles away from where that fish farm is located. So significant and far reaching problems. We also know that there's additional problems in, that these sea farms right, have to the marine ecosystems. And so I won't go through all of this, but I want to, because it gets a little tech, techy, um, but I want to raise the issue of um, freshwater diversion and the things that we're doing to try and make things better. So hatcheries have been suggested as an answer to some of the problems that we have with extinction um, of wild animals. And so if we can breed them on land and then release them in the water, we think that might be a solution, but we're finding that's not actually working. Um, so what we're finding is the, the hatchery fish make up in the salmon instance, 80% of salmon in the river, but the total salmon run is still collapsing and we're not saving those animals. This is, this is spending a lot of time and money and energy and it's not a solution that's actually working. Um, and we're thinking about doing that with other animals when we haven't proven it can work with the animals we're already trying. So just something to be thinking about. And again, we're raising more animals in a factory farm setting, uh, thinking that it's a good idea for other purposes. Fish stocking is something that people also don't tend to think about, um, and I won't talk about it a lot, but just knowing that up to maybe 150 billion fish are raised in captivity to be released in the wild, and that's just in the U.S. Um, so there's different kinds of bait fish that are being raised, um, and that's so people can go and fish other animals um, out of the wild settings. And so when we're thinking about comparing um, the impacts, both environmental and just overall impacts. If we're thinking that there are 75 billion, maybe terrestrial animals slaughtered for food annually, and we know that there are 8 billion chickens, for instance, and we have 40 to 160 billion farm fish slaughtered every year. And again, as Amy said, we really don't know the numbers in detail and that's a problem in and of itself. So what we know is that we don't have welfare regulations. We don't have a lot of lawsuits because there aren't statutes people can rely on to sue for the problems that these facilities are causing. We don't even have agency guidance in sufficient um, amount. So thinking about the, uh, the additional problems that we're having, um, we know that there have been a lot of problems around the world for all kinds of reasons based on the COVID-19 pandemic. And so looking specifically at how that particular situation has impacted or, and intersected with 
the aquaculture industry, we can see that the PPP loans um, were going to, that's the, the financial assistance to keep uh, businesses going during the pandemic. We're not getting to the smaller businesses, but to the more sort of centralized large agribusinesses, which is really potentially problematic. We also saw interestingly that the government in the US made a decision to actually purchase seafood to help businesses out when they weren't doing that for other kinds of businesses. They weren't buying cars or other kinds of things to help out the other industries. So it's an interesting choice again, for making uh, economic decisions and using taxpayer money to fund these and support prop up these industries. We saw a significant disease transmission of COVID in these facilities. There wasn't enough protective equipment for the, the workers. We saw that there are significant OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety Health Administration violations, um, where workers were not being protected. There are some lawsuits pending for that. We saw some restrictions on seasonal workers um, because they couldn't uh, move across jurisdictions. We saw some significant um, infection rates for COVID and some mortality numbers, though they haven't broken those out by the seafood industry in really uh, granular detail. So it's hard to tell exactly what the mortality numbers are just for that segment. But we know that hundreds and hundreds of workers in the food industry in general have died as a result of COVID. We also saw that the USDA used this as an opportunity to stop collecting data on farm wage uh, information and to, to stop enforcing some of the environmental regulations that pertained to the agriculture industry. Some of those things seem to be coming back and we're hopeful that they'll stay. So really quickly looking at the international sphere. So we're, we're focusing heavily on the United States, but we just wanna give you a sense of what's going on around the world. So this deep sea ocean farming is a, a sort of a newer innovation in aquaculture. And so this is a pictures of um, the Ocean Farm One, which is off the Norway coast. Um, and they're thinking about 16,000 tons annually of salmon. They've already had a couple of escapements. One was very small, one was a bit larger. Um, and so this is what's happening with our oceans. And it's something that you should um, just have a sense of the scale of these operations thinking about how the international aspects are playing out. Um, there's a lot of transmission of these animals across jurisdictional lines. And so again, where we have worker issues or environmental issues, they transfer across those lines as well. As I said before, the cleaner fish have been used to eat sea life lice off of the farmed salmon. Um, there's a question about how well it's working. There's certainly a question about the welfare of both sets of animals in that uh, context. We know that 28,000 of these uh, cleaner fish died in two separate occasions um, in Norway. We also know that they can be uh, sucked up sort of in the, the slaughter process for the salmon themselves and be killed that way. Um, and these are animals that, as we've said, have passed the self-awareness test, so they understand what's happening to them and to those around them. We also need to be paying attention when we're thinking about international matters about the impact on First Nations. We know that here in the US, we're not very good at following the treaty obligations that we have to our First Nations and indigenous communities. In British Columbia, Canada, leaders called for the end to the net pen salmon farming that was happening and affecting their ability to maintain their own ability to fish. Um, that those There are some lawsuits around that that are ongoing. We also know that if we wanted to as a global community, that if we ended marine farming, um, that that solution would do more to um, improve the environment than even addressing climate change, overfishing, and so many other things really, really quickly. We have the capacity to actually turn this around quickly, and then we need more conversation about it. We need more money um, directed toward it, and the governments and private uh, industry need to be talking about this more. As you will increasingly see, aquaculture and its impacts are not at all limited to the animals that are utilized in these operations, but they have a massive impact on humans and the environment and all over the world. Uh, in this regard, we wanted to highlight that there are a number of additional issues for those who work in these facilities, and Kathy touched on those a little bit. But many of these issues also arise in the context of terrestrial animal agriculture. So specifically for inland aquaculture operations, they, they are similar, but then those who work in offshore aquaculture operations, some of the same threats and challenges that are faced by the wild caught fishing 
industry apply equally to them as well. But there are, of course, some unique additional considerations for the aquacultural industry too. In fact, aquaculture is one of the most hazardous industries in the entire world, and the risks are very poorly understood and actually largely neglected. There are approximately 18 million workers in the aquaculture industry, so it obviously impacts on a huge number of people and families around the world. And these issues range from worker safety issues relating to the equipment to diseases. These are occupational diseases and zoonotic diseases. Uh, some health risks from working either in the heat or the cold, things like dehydration, work-related neck and upper body limb disorders, respiratory issues, allergies, parasites, bacteria from feed, skin issues, and hazards relating to ingestion and inhalation. There's also issues relating to chemical and other exposures some kind of injuries, falls, bites, drowning, electrocution. These are all different things that are documented within the aquacultural industry for the workers. Additional problems also emerge relating to stress, long hours, night shifts, and working alone. Then at a kind of broader level, some of the welfare considerations for these workers include things like wages, housing, access to healthcare, and transportation. Notably, there are certain exemptions within the law, so the Occupational Health and Safety Act and some of the regulations and rules, there are exemptions for aquaculture, and these are, raise other issues relating to immigration and visas, working in harmful conditions, and the list kind of goes on and on, but needless to say that it's not just the animals, but even the workers who work in these facilities. Great. So, of course, all of these harms would be incomplete if we're not addressing the large number of animals themselves who are impacted in these facilities and, of course, their welfare. But what is animal welfare and how do we measure, measure it? Uh, there's no real universal definition, but on the slide is one of the kind of widely accepted examples of what animal welfare is. And it arose in the UK in 1965, and they called the Five Freedoms. And these five freedoms for animals include freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and then freedom from fear and distress. These are kind of widely accepted all around the world, and many of them are incorporated into animal protection and animal welfare legislation across the globe. So against that background then, if we're looking at aquaculture specifically, some of the welfare concerns that are raised are illustrated on the slide. And again, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but as I'm talking, you can start to kind of read through them and see uh, many of these again arise in the animal agricultural factory farming sense. So it's also worth noting that numerous studies show that poor welfare of animals actually equates with poor production. So even for those who don't care about animal welfare and are purely interested in economic and production, they should care about animal welfare from that perspective. So things like crowding, overcrowding, injury, death, and we've spoken about some of these already, so I won't go into them again, but some of the lesser considered ones might be things like environmental enrichment, depression, and what the animals are fed. Often they're not fed a very healthy diet that is suitable for their needs. Looking at one of those issues specifically, stunning and slaughter, uh, when we talk about terrestrial animals, there's actually legislation in place, uh, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act at a federal level in the US that at least requires the stunning of, of certain animals used in factory farming. So this is to have more humane methods of killing. But unfortunately, when it comes to aquatic animals, no such law exists. In fact, there's no federal law or state level law that requires stunning for these animals. And this allows for very cruel and inhumane methods to be used to kill them. And on the slide, again, are just some examples of some of these methods. So for example, for a self-aware animal who is sentient, gutting them while they're alive is obviously extremely cruel, especially if they can suffer and feel pain. So it's really, there's a big gap in the law when it comes to the regulating stunning before slaughter, and it's something that needs to be recognized. Right, so moving on to the regulatory and legal frameworks in, in this section, we're going to be highlighting at a very high level some of the issues. Since we're going to be talking a lot about the US, I think it's important to contextualize what US aquaculture looks like. Actually, compared to the rest of the world, the industry is relatively small, but as we've said, it's growing, and not only is it growing, it's actively being promoted and pursued by the government and various governmental agencies, and then, of course, those who are in the industry. So on the slide is a picture from NOAA, 
In 2017, the industry was valued in the US at $1.5 billion. And the vast majority of this was actually coming from fresh water oper uh, operations versus marine water. So in terms of marine species, the predominant ones that were utilized were uh, oysters, then clams, then salmon, and then mussels and shrimp. So again, we're seeing the different kinds of species arising here in the US. So in thinking more um, about legal protections, we wanna give you a sense of the overall legal framework. So before we focus a little bit on just the aquatic animals specifically, just thinking generally about what protections there are for animals in the US, we have, as I mentioned earlier, the Animal Welfare Act, we have some protections for endangered species, um, for different kinds of wildlife, including endangered species protection, marine mammal protection, the Lacey Act. And some of these protect certain kinds of animals and certain some of them protect certain kinds of uh, animals in certain contexts. We also have anti-cruelty statutes that could apply to animals in general and aquatic animals sometimes. Um, these have not been widely used. Um, and we have regulatory protections, things as Amy's been mentioning, NOAA, we have the public health service policy, the guide to the care and use of laboratory animals. Obviously, these don't all affect aqu um, aqua <laughs> excuse me, animals in aquaculture, but they can impact on aquatic animals. And so thinking more uh, clearly about whether they do or they don't, you won't be surprised to know that there's an awful lot of legal exclusions in the US about, uh, which limit how these laws can be applied to which animals in what context and when. So under the Animal Welfare Act, there's no coverage for animals used for food and for most research animals. So clearly the animals being raised for food in aquaculture are exempt from even the minimal protections the Animal Welfare Act offers. We also know that the wildlife laws, things like Endangered Species Act, don't apply to the animals who are used in aquaculture. Generally, we're not using endangered species. We're not supposed to be using them in aquaculture facilities. Um, so the wildlife laws don't apply for that reason, but they also don't apply because these animals aren't considered wild. State anti-cruelty laws, um, as a general rule, often exclude aquatic animals from protection. And so what laws we have there may not apply. Most also exclude animals used in agriculture, or fishing, or research. And so if there isn't a species exclusion, there's likely a context use-based exclusion that, so that the anti-cruelty laws aren't going to cover the animals who are being treated poorly in these aquaculture facilities. We also know that we have the Humane Methods of Livestock Slaughter Act, but uh, aquatic animals are not covered by this act. And one thing I'll just note is in some of these acts, right, the, the choice to exclude aquatic animals is conscious and explicit and articulated. And sometimes we just think so little of these animals, they're just not included. And the idea was we, we would never include the protections we give to other animals um, and extend those protections to aquatic animals. And that's one of the, that's the situation with the slaughter laws that we have. They're not also aquatic animals and aquaculture animals are not um, covered by transportation laws. And we know that these animals are transported live many, many, uh, many, many hundreds of miles, um, sometimes across oceans or, or more. Um, there's no coverage or protection for them in breeding. And the Federal Meat Inspection Act has no coverage except for catfish. So we have some laws that protect animals and most all of them exclude aquatic animals or animals used in aquaculture. So what regulations do we have that can affect the animals in these contexts? There is a National Aquaculture Development Act um, and that has uh, an idea of sort of looking at aquaculture development. It is certainly not an Animal Protection Act and animal welfare is not a big, is not a part of that act, though it is a placeholder, if you will, someplace we can go and try and um, seek uh, animal welfare protection. These other acts, Federal Water Pollution, uh, the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, um, you can see that these acts are designed to do other things. And now that we have aquaculture as an industry, we can decide to um, look at these acts and see if there are maybe some areas where they're applicable. I'll tell you right now that right now, as they're, as they're construed, um, they don't apply to aquaculture really either. And so there might be some water quality issues. There might be some other things that tangentially we can, we can look to. And I'll talk about the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Act in a minute. So basically these acts that we have don't address aquatic animals um, in the aquaculture setting, but they do have maybe food safety or some other um, uh, 
hooks, if you will, for us to begin to talk about things that can protect animals and, and make the aquaculture industry a little bit more appropriately regulated. So um, I'll just focus for a minute on the, uh, the Aqua Act, which was an act that has been uh, promoted at the federal level in Congress um, the last couple of sessions. It hasn't moved forward. So this is an effort at the federal level to actually regulate aquaculture. And so there is this effort, there's an idea that an understanding that it needs to happen. It hasn't happened yet, um, but it does talk about permitting. It does talk about reviewing operations. It does talk about um, some important things. Um, it doesn't go um, as far as dealing seriously, I think with animal welfare or any of that. We'll see if that act is reintroduced this year in this Congress, um, and then we'll be able to see how seriously Congress might be taking these issues. So there are some other acts, you know, insurance programs, um, transportation issues, um, just to be aware of because they are, again, potential avenues to open these conversations about what's appropriate in the aquaculture regulation space. There are a number of agencies. This is the complicated sort of overlapping area um, of jurisdictional control, if you will. And that makes it even harder to think about appropriate regulation. There's not just one agency we can go to and say, please take care of these issues. You can see all of these agencies, FDA, USDA, NOAA, EPA, they all have elements of uh, autonomy and authority to act in this space. And so it's gonna take a lot of conversation to try to figure out what makes sense um, jointly. And there's a lot of, there's federal control, there's state control, and certainly uh, tribal control. And we need to be think, of, think about how to manage all of those jurisdictions. So giving just one um, example, there hasn't been, as I said before, a lot of uh, cases on aquaculture because we don't have statutes that regulate them. So the one case that is really important to have a sense of how the federal government is looking at regulation of aquaculture is this one, the Gulf Fisherman's case. And so it's a Fifth Circuit case in which the court said the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Act does not actually regulate aquaculture. So NOAA was trying to um, issue permits to do aquaculture in the open waters through this act. And the court said, that's not what this act is for. This act is basically to regulate fishing. Aquaculture isn't fishing. And so this is a really useful statement from the court to delineate, right, and to distinguish aquaculture from wild-caught fishing and to say, yeah, we have a lot of regulation around wild-caught fishing. Go back to Congress and ask them for regulation for aquaculture, but you can't do it this way. So there are some state regulations that Amy will talk about now. Great. So this kind of intersection between the different agencies is not something that's unique at a federal level, it happens at the state level too. So obviously aquaculture is regulated at the federal level, but then each of the states have their own set of regulations that dictates how the industry is managed. In Oregon, for example, there's a bill that's currently making its way through the legislative session, HB 2776, and what that bill proposes is to transfer the regulatory authority over the propagation of finfish specifically from the State Department of Fish and Wildlife to the State Department of Ag Agriculture. So we're seeing there that kind of shift and providing some sort of certainty as to which agency has the regulatory authority over this industry. Another thing that this bill proposes to do is to prohibit releasing finfish produced by a private commercial aquaculture facility into the waters of the state unless the fish is certified by the State Department of Agriculture. So that's obviously to deal with some of the issues that we've seen with the release of fish and escapements and things like that, which is a positive step, although unfortunately there are a number of issues that aren't adequately or properly regulated in this bill. And one, for, one example is reporting, monitoring and enforcement. And then of course, another very critical issue which we've touched on is the welfare of the animals. There's still very little welfare regulation, if any, and specifically to the slaughtering of these animals. So this is also important because in Oregon, fish specifically are included as sentient animals in Oregon law. So looking a little bit at a different state, we have the state of Washington. And one very important example was in 2017, there was a major, major escapement uh, due to the nets breaking open and over 250,000 non-native Atlantic salmon were released into Puget Sound, which obviously has a major 
impact on the environment and native species. So there was actually a lawsuit in terms of the Clean Water Act, as Kathy mentioned, one of the tangential legislation which is used. Uh, there was actually subsequently a settlement for 2.75 million by the agricultural facility, which is Cook Aquaculture, who we've mentioned. And that money was used for legal fees and then also to fund the Puget Sound restoration projects. And subsequent to that escapement, there was actually some regulation promulgated, HB 2957 in 2018, which, to, which was to end the non-native marine net pens. So they were actually trying to prohibit something that had happened from ha happening again. So then what happened was Cook Aquaculture switched their focus from non-native species to native species or steelhead trout. And what they, what they did was they applied for a permit for this and they received a five-year permit. But this was challenged because a lot of the environmental groups said there wasn't sufficient environmental impact statement done on what this new kind of facility would do. And there's ongoing litigation on this issue and it's going through different courts and it's raising different issues from the authority to issue these permits to things like the impact that it will have on endangered species and the broader environmental regulation. So as Kathy mentioned, there's not much litigation, but we are seeing this increasing and specifically in states where there's offshore aquacultural operations. Another one of the very major issues in seafood is seafood fraud and labeling. And the perception is that this might only relate to wild caught fishing, but it actually relates to aquaculture too, and increasingly so. Uh, this seafood fraud comes in different forms, but according to NOAA, there are three main types. The first is seafood substitution, and that's when a lowest value species is substituted for one that is a higher value. Then there's seafood short weighting, which is when the weight of the food is misrepresented. And they do this through practices such as overglazing, soaking, and breading. And the final one is the mislabeling of seafood. And that's the one we're going to talk about a little bit more. And that's where the qualities of seafood are mislabeled in addition to the species name or even things like the country of origin. And this is to avoid either regulations or fees or even to sneak in illegally caught fish or aquatic animals with, into the supply chain. So one of the things, again, that NOAA says on their website is that there's a self-policing seafood industry. And they mentioned that members of the National Fisheries Institute, which is the leading trade group promoting seafood in the US, has pledged to abide by industry principles of economic integrity by not selling seafood that is short weighted or counted it has a wrong name so they've made these promises um, but obviously self-regulation generally is a problem and self-policing is, is equally a problem what we need is sufficient legal regulation with definable legal standards and that is enforced by governmental agencies what's the harm of things like seafood fraud well there's a number of different aspects uh, ranging from the health impacts, people that have allergies to certain types of food that obviously affects vulnerable groups such as pregnant women and children, particularly more than other groups. There's a huge amount of environmental impacts, especially if we're talking about things like threatened, vulnerable and endangered species. It raises consumer issues, there's economic impacts that actually negatively impacts on the industries themselves. And then things like traceability, accountability all play into seafood fraud. I wanted to highlight one of the recent studies that was done by The Guardian where they took an analysis of 44 studies and this, this was released in March 2021 and their study and analysis found that nearly 40,000, sorry, 40% 40 of 9,000 products from restaurants, markets and fishmongers were mislabeled. So 40% is a huge amount. And again, as I talk, just read through the difference, I'll pull a few examples. For example, in Germany, nearly 50% of tested samples purported to be king scallops were Japanese scallops. So that's basically half were mislabeled. And then of 130 shark fillets bought from Italian fish markets and fishmongers, again, also close to half were mislabeled with cheaper and more unpopular species of shark. So this also becomes particularly problematic when we have endangered and vulnerable species. And then of course, people are being misled by the products that they are being that they are buying. In one sample, prawn balls that were sold in Singapore contained pork and actually did not even contain a trace of prawn. Very concerning as a consumer. 
And then finally, seafood fraud is enforced by a few agencies, including NOAA Law Enforcement, the US FDA, and NOAA Fisheries and Seafood Inspection Program, although it's really the FDA that has primary federal responsibility for the safety of the seafood in the US. In 1997, the FDA adopted a regulation that required all seafood processors to utilize the preventative system of food safety. And this system is HACCP, or the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. Seafood was actually the first food commodity in the US to utilize the science-based system of preventative food safety controls. So there are definitely things in place to prevent this from happening, but again, it speaks to the enforcement. Some of the kind of general rules for product laboring that aren't specific to seafood, but which will become relevant when we start discussing alternatives in a little bit, are things like the name of the products, the ingredients need to be listed, the dates by which they should be used by, how to store them, who they made by, nutrition facts, and health claims. So again, these are kind of general standards that we see, and they should be applied to seafood properly. One of the other bills that happened in Louisiana at a state level in 2019, HB 335, was a law that required restaurants to display the country of origin. And so there we're starting to see that traceability so that consumers have at least oversight as to where their products are coming from. And another key issue in the labeling discussion is third party certifications. And essentially what these third parties do is they are meant to act independently from and have a set of standards and then are approached by industry. And then if they meet those certain standards, they are granted that certification and they can display it on their products or in their marketing and advertising or otherwise subject to how they're allowed to use it. But these aren't legal bodies. These are not legal regulations. They're not legal standards. They are set by these bodies themselves and then they decide who gets their certification. So again, we're seeing a gap in the law when it comes to these things. We see things like no impact on critical habitat, compliance with water quality, uh, reduction of carbon footprint, and then we see things like sustainability and animal welfare. So there's a whole lot of promises behind these standards, but again, these are being set by people. They're not being necessarily enforced and they don't have that force of law. So they present a number of challenges, uh, although some people say that there's at least some level of protection and a higher level than the law currently grants. Some of the other labeling considerations that come into play there are things like greenwashing and humane washing. So we see things a lot on seafood that claim that they are sustainable or that that's humane fish or it's a high welfare sea product. Similar again to what we see with terrestrial animal agricultural products, we're seeing it increasingly so with seafood products. And why is this important? Well, it can mislead consumers. And I wanted to highlight one case that's currently ongoing at the moment with Animal Outlook and again, Cook Aquaculture. So Animal Outlook undertook the first ever undercover investigation or expose of the salmon aquaculture facility. It was in Maine in the US and Cook is one of the largest salmon producers in North America. And the person who did the, who did the undercover investigation said that they witnessed a huge amount of cruelty and suffering from overcrowding to filthy tanks and just really egregious abuse was happening at the hands of workers of these animals. And unfortunately, although it was raised with the authorities, the main authorities declined to pursue a criminal charge. And essentially what then Animal Outlook did was they approached the Richmond Law Group and they filed a consumer protection suit. And what they did was they said that Cook uh, was misrepresenting its products because they were saying that their products were sustainable and they said that they were naturally raised, they were ecologically sound and that they adhered to optimal animal welfare standards. This was actually deceitful and it was misleading to the consumers of their products. And in fact was in violation of the District of Columbia Consumer Protection Procedures Act. That's what they alleged. And as of the date that we're filming this, there hasn't been an outcome to the case. But I, again, I think it's important to note that these have been happening in the terrestrial animal agriculture movement for a while. And now slowly but surely, we're starting to see the same things develop for aquatic animals, which is very promising because these industries should be held to the same sort of standards and accountability that other industries are. So we're, we're gonna see this increasingly so over the years. Another legal effort that I wanted to highlight was in the Trump administration in 2020 uh, produced an executive order promoting the American seafood competitiveness and economic growth. 
And as the name suggests, the whole idea of it is to, in fact, promote the seafood in America. This is important because by weight, the US imports over 85% of their seafood that's consumed. So as a country, there's definitely interest in wanting to promote your own domestic market over having to import a huge amount of your food. There's definitely a rationale for wanting to do this. And then, of course, the other rationales such as economics, jobs, providing safe food, having more control over things that you can regulate yourself and, and things like that. And then not like other things that were done during this administration, one of the goals is to remove some of the regulation and how they refer to it is outdated and unnecessarily burdensome regulations. And that can in fact lead to protecting our aquatic environments. Some of the key things that are addressed in this framework uh, executive order are about removing barriers to aquaculture permitting, identifying aquaculture opportunity areas, uh, improving transparency, updating the National Aqu Aquaculture Development Plan, and things like promoting aquatic animal health, and then of course promoting the industry and things like that. So one of the things that they were trying to do was uh, avoid some of the adverse court, court ruling and try and really specify which agencies had the authority to deal with some of these issues. And subsequent to this coming out, they've already actually done a request for information. NOAA did to identify certain aquaculture areas. So it's very much already in progress and will continue to be implemented uh, over time. But again, promoting aquaculture and also promoting wild caught fishing and with it promoting some of, uh, well, essentially all of the negative outcomes that we've highlighted throughout this presentation. And this trend for the government to promote and support the industry is not new. On this slide, you'll see some examples of other government and political support for the aquaculture, fishing and seafood industries generally. This ranges from things like the 2020 dietary guidelines where there's an urge to continuously increase seafood consumption. In fact, uh, there should be regular servings of seafood for everyone who is six months old and up. In a, in a separate document, the EPA, FDA had advice about eating shellfish and fish, and they actually said that they recommend that people do this at least two times a week for a woman of a childbearing age and included pregnant women and breastfeeding women and young children in that category. Uh, throughout NOAA website, you'll be able to find kind of stories about showing seafood some love and again, linking this to health benefits and the health aspects, promoting this as a healthy Thing for people to be consuming. Aside from the health perks that are promoted is the actual economic, the tangible economic support that's received by these industries, everything from subsidies to bailouts, and then during the trade wars receiving 530 million to support the industry uh, that were impacted by the retali retaliatory tar tariffs. And one critical thing to note in this context is that it's not necessarily protecting indigenous fishers, the smaller operations and aquaculturalists. It's generally supporting these big harmful operations that we've been highlighting throughout. And so switching our lens to, again, the international, um, it's useful to consider because even though we're not talking about wild caught fishing, obviously that's um, affected and international law tends to focus on wild caught fishing. But as Amy suggested, we're importing an awful lot of aquaculture products into the US. We are actually still also exporting. And that's true with lots of our agricultural products. So there's a lot of international trade and that we need to be thinking about. So generally speaking, um, the laws are focusing on like the law of the seas, the illegal unreported and unregulated fishing. Um, we don't have yet any specific global aquaculture standards. We don't have a treaty and um, we don't have a convention or a protocol yet. So we're left with some independent organizations who have their codes or their standards, as Amy was suggesting, which are voluntary and non-binding. They don't have the force of law. We have the World Organization for Animal Health, which has an aquatic animal welfare code, but again, uh, there's no force um, to make anyone uh, follow that code. So we have these industry bodies and we have some accreditation. And the good news is we are seeing increasing consumer demand for regulation, for labeling, and for attention to welfare issues. So the US is party to a number of international agreements, again, none specific to aquaculture because they don't exist. Um, but again, there's some uh, ancillary, if you will, agreements that could have or do have some impact in this space. And so I've just listed um, them here. 
we won't go into all of these, but just to think about um, how we can use the international agreements that do exist to, again, open up conversations about how these animals are used and protected is a good idea. So I won't go into all of these, but there is space for us to be having those conversations um, in spaces where we're not having those conversations yet at all, or at least not well or much. Likewise, the U.S. is party to um, member of organizations, international organizations, where these conversations should be taking place when we're talking about development, when we're talking about funding, when we're talking about trade. These are spaces in which we should be having conversations to say, okay, how can we, if we're going to be doing this, we should be doing it responsibly. What does that look like? And the government of the United States can sort of throw its weight around, if you will, and say, okay, we, we want this issue to be addressed. We want it to be taken seriously for the benefit, not only of the industry in our country, the consumers in our country, but the environmental resources and uh, of the planet. So looking ahead, we've talked an awful lot about um, a lot of things. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about some positive things or steps forward. And Amy's gonna start us off by talking about alternatives. Great. Yes, one of the very promising developments in the space of seafood is the increase in alternatives. While most people would tend to think of plant-based, they are actually an ever-increasing kind of alternatives. And these include cultivated foods or otherwise referred to as cultured or cell-based or even lab-grown. Then there are fermentation-based products. And then there's even some that are made from fungi. So in terms of processes, we are starting to see things like actually 3D printed seafood. And, and that's in fact happening right now. So we're undoubtedly living in some very exciting times. But obviously, all of these alternatives raise a number of different considerations and ranging from access and availability to pricing to consumer protection, labeling again, and others. And of course, with all of this comes a number of legal and policy questions. So we're going to touch on these very briefly. So as compared to traditional seafood and even terrestrial animal agriculture, alternative seafood is quite unique and it offers some uh, unique challenges, opp opportunities, strengths and weaknesses. And on the slide, you'll see some of these and this is taken from a Good Food Institute report. And uh, some of these are similar to what we'll see with terrestrial animal alternatives, such as better, you know, obviously dealing with welfare, environment, human rights, and antibiotic issues, because those are taken out of the equation to a large extent. However, some of these are, are unique. So one thing is that there's a huge amount of people who are, in fact, allergic to seafood. So if they, for example, would, con would be able to consume plant-based alternatives, that issue would be eliminated from that. Um, the alternatives present a case to counteract a number of the negative issues that we see with seafood, and these include things like bycatch and food waste, food waste, and some of these we've touched on already. But it is important to note that many people are actually very hesitant of alternatives. There's a lot of negative consumer beliefs and attitudes to overcome in order for these to become accessible, available, and successful. People also tend to think that seafood is much healthier than terrestrial animal uh, agricultural products. So that's another thing that needs to be overcome. Great, on the next slide, we have uh, a bunch of different brands and seafood alternatives. These are just a couple of different examples that are out there. This is increasing all the time. These are mostly plant-based that you'll see on the slide, um, but they, there is a couple of fermentation-based ones. And it's just really to illustrate that you can pretty much now get anything from uh, prawn to shrimp to fish to really any kind of seafood that one can dream of consuming. But with this increase in alternative becomes increased legal and policy considerations. And many of these, again, are similar to those that we've seen in alternative meat, dairy, and egg products, but there's also unique ones. As they become more and more popular, they present a bigger threat to these existing industries and we see a rise in challenging them. There's court cases, there's legislation that are trying to curb the success of these products. And how is this done? Well, there's a variety of ways, but one is in terms of what these products can be actually named or called. So there's a huge, a huge amount of case law and law that says that uh, non-animal agricultural products cannot have the bear the name of these products. So you can't call something meat that's not meat or milk that's not milk or seafood that's not seafood, or at least not in the traditional sense as, as, as we tend to think of them. Because why? 
consumers are misled by that. They are not able to make correct choices. They might not have the same nutritional value. There's a huge amount of different considerations. And then that ties into how these uh, products should be labeled. Should they have specifically right across the front, you know, this is not a real thing. We should call this an imitation thing. That's what many of the animal agricultural industries would want to promote. Again, we touched on this. It also creates agency authority who actually can regulate these products. Um, so there was originally when the cell-based meat and cell-based seafood products were coming out, there was a lot of back and forth about whether this would be the FDA or the USDA jurisdiction, so much so that they entered into, a, into an agreement to actually properly specify who had the authority to regulate what product and at which stage in production. So uh, I won't go into all of the other ones, but the, a number of other issues arise from things in administrative law to what constitutional law and what people say is against their freedom and against their rights. Um, and then again, food safety issues, which are pretty important about things like allergies. What does the nutritional information need to say? So I could go on, but you'll start to see the more that these increase, the more legal issues that arise from them and the more pushback there is. So there's a need for legal certainty as these alternatives increase. And in, rec in recognizing that, uh, in, uh, in October 2020, the FDA actually put out a request for information specifically about the labeling of foods that are comprised of or containing cultured seafood cells. So this was specifically for seafood, lab-grown seafood. And uh, essentially, they wanted to get public and organizational input into what the label should say, what these products should be called to ensure that they are not misleading to consumers, but also to ensure that they're in line with the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and all of the relevant provi provisions that are in there that are meant to protect the public and protect consumers. Obviously, things like you're not allowed to offer food for sale that is under the name of another food. And this ties back exactly to the mislabeling of seafood that's currently happening. So this is already happening in the traditional seafood industry. And now we're trying to um, replicate that in the alternatives. So that's just one recent example. The comments only closed in March 2021. So they're obviously still going through this. But this is law as it's developing on these new and exciting alternatives. And so we've mentioned a few times that there are a specific conversation that we should be having, specific consideration given to uh, tribal and indigenous people. We know that part of the reason the development of aquaculture is taking off so quickly is because of good reasons in that people care about folks having access to food and they see it as a method of poverty alleviation. And those are really good goals to achieve. Um, we would suggest this is not the right method to achieve those goals. But if you want to look at uh, responsible methodologies for raising animals in a controlled farm setting, we should actually be looking uh, to tribal and indigenous people who have been doing some of this work for centuries, actually. And so we know that in the United States, we don't have a history of respecting sovereignty or jurisdiction or traditions of indigenous people. We're violating treaties. We're taking uh, advantage of water rights uh, of those folks in controlling their resources in ways that we shouldn't. Those issues that have been uh, fought over for a number of decades, uh, for sure, are replicating in the aquaculture and wild caught space. So thinking about how to bring in the voices of indigenous uh, and tribal people in the United States and across the planet is an important way to enlarge this conversation about respectful treatment of people and of animals. And to that end, the IUCN um, is ha has a global indigenous network for aquaculture and the UN has declared next year, 2022, the year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. So we're hoping to see more conversation in that space um, that's working across boundaries, across jurisdictions um, and across cultures. So just to, um, we're coming close to the end. We wanna just highlight again, as Amy said at the beginning, there's so many more things we could be talking about. Um, each of the things that we've mentioned as well as things we haven't mentioned, but we wanna just highlight some emerging issues. And so as we've said, 
aquaculture is a growth industry. People are pushing, industries pushing it. Um, consumers think it's a good idea based on the information they have, and governments are seeing this as an opportunity. So it's growing. There's a lot of funding, a lot of venture capital, a lot of movement towards increasing aquaculture. And that's making it happen in places it didn't happen, making it happen for species it hasn't happened with before. So it's just growing in every possible conceivable way. So we wanted to highlight just a few things so people can have it on their radar to be thinking about. Jellyfish, sea urchins, and octopus are some of the species that um, folks are branching out to. Um, so jellyfish are seen as uh, a good source of food, um, one that not everyone eats across the globe, but maybe folks are saying they should eat because it sort of um, has some nutritive value. And um, we're seeing some of the wild populations, interestingly, of jellyfish increase because we're killing a lot of their predators in the wild. So people say, oh, there's a bunch of them, let's kill them and eat them. This would be a great thing and bring them on land and, uh, and raise them for food. Sea urchins uh, is something that is a growing area. People are finding them easy to farm and profitable. And so there's funding for this. Part of the reason that this uh, started, um, at least in large part, was because uh, folks wanted them to stop eating the kelp um, because they're seeing kelp as a climate mitigation effort. So it captures uh, some of the carbon that we don't want released, but also we want it for certain other animals. We don't care really about the sea urchin. So we're seeing them again as sort of disposable species, take them out, solve a couple problems, farm them and have people eat them. Um, so potentially problematic. All those assumptions are really problematic. Octopus farming is something people have been trying for a long time and uh, pretty unsuccessfully, but just recently having some significant success. These again, remember our animals highly intelligent. Um, they are, have consciousness. And so their confinement in this context is very, very problematic. And we're taking some from the wild populations to use to breed um, in on the um, terrestrial facilities and so we're having some negative impact on the wild populations that are already threatened um, problematically. Another thing you'll see as uh, touted as a good thing is lots of algae products. You were saying, you know, it's a great source of nutrition, it's sort of sustainable, we can just grow algae, we can take it from the wild or we can grow it in a factory farm setting. So this is just something we, we think people should be paying attention to. It's increasing exponentially without um, significant attention paid to the impact on the environment and on the wild animals for whom uh, are, who are relying on algae. And there's a complete lack of regulation in this space. So we're concerned that this is really gonna be a problematic direction. We've talked a little bit about bait fish and stocking fish, so I won't uh, go into that, but just be aware that the numbers, again, of these animals being raised in facilities is incredibly large, no protection for them right now at all. We've talked a little bit about the human rights issues. There are a lot of undercover investigations and exposés that have shifted their focus from terrestrial factory farms to aquatic factory farms. And so you'll be seeing some of the results of those uh, coming out in months um, and years to come. So briefly, we, we want to sort of reel it back and talk about why it's important to focus on the animal's interest when we're thinking about regulating in the aquaculture space. So failure to do that impoverishes the development of the law because we're not actually addressing some of the issues we need to address. So it hinders the creation of appropriate mechanisms that restrain the cruelty and abuse that we inflict on these animals. And that's something we need to be thinking about explicitly. It also constrains a broad understanding and conceptualization and implementation of actual animal protection measures. If we're not thinking about the animal's interests, we can't really accurately be doing that kind of work. And we forget to think about how animals fit into the environment when we see them just as a resource that can be taken out of the environment, bred, and used for our own purposes. And even when we do have laws that protect animals, if we don't think about the animal's interests and we only think about the human interest driving those laws, it deprioritizes the enforcement of those laws. We know that it's hard for humans not to center ourselves in our thinking, not to privilege sort of the in-group in decision-making and not to, uh, to figure out how to share the benefits, whatever they are economic and otherwise uh, beyond our own group, um, especially when there's some costs. And we wanna be clear that the alternatives are good and we think there are really good ways to move beyond not needing the aquaculture industry, but there are some costs to that that need to be taken into account as we've addressed. 
And so it's harder to think about this when there are some costs that are real and certainly a lot of theoretical costs that, that aren't real and people are concerned about. Um, so we need to do better, but it takes a significant effort to overcome these kind of entrenched paradigms. So that's one of the things that we do at Lewis and Clark through the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. And so part of our work focuses on acknowledging these problems, adapting, addressing them, trying to develop resilience, not just in ourselves and our students who become practitioners in the law, but also in the legal systems themselves. A focus on sustainability, and we know that word is overused, um, and so we try to use it carefully. Um, an effort to engage with others, to work, to build responses, and to clarify the weaknesses in the legal system so that we can address them. And so some of the things that we have done along those lines, we worked on a national consumer class action case that was uh, welfare focused for beta fish. Um, we, through Amy's good work, um, developed World Aquatic Animal Day, which is a day that we set aside to educate um, all across the globe on issues relating to aquatic animals, not just on aquaculture. Um, we do research papers and we have worked with global partners um, in the US and around the globe on marine protected areas, on fish uh, surveys about uh, what laws are protecting which animals where, um, and then we could go on. We're working right now on humane slaughter legislation that we hope one day will soon will be implemented. So as we go forward, when we've given you an awful lot of information today and we appreciate the time that you've taken to, to sit with us through the CLE. And so thinking forward and thinking about how we can work to change the current legal structures that we have, we think that there are a few things that we can do. We can, as we've said, re-examine our frameworks and educate ourselves about the nature of animals. That's why we talk so much about the science. Educate ourselves about the harms we inflict on them. Some of the things that we learn are because we go look for them. A lot of the harms that are inflicted on aquatic animals in general and aquaculture animals in particular, people don't even know about. So they don't know to work to address those harms. In addressing those harms, we can change our personal behavior. We can minimize our involvement in the exploitation of animals. We can see intersections between different forms of exploitation of animals and other non-human uh, non and human animals. We can make space for these conversations in our work and support others who are doing this work. We can identify and support systemic change work to update and improve the legal system. And fundamentally, we want folks to be hopeful about change. And that requires us being patient, being persistent, and being resilient. We know that animals are not our property. They're not products. And they're not ours. And so we need to pursue improvements um, to reset our thinking about animals and how we deal with them socially and legally. And that includes focusing on animal interests, including them explicitly in our decision-making, accepting that science shows that other non-human animals feel and have capacities that we need to acknowledge, like thinking, planning, reasoning, and accept that there is a legal obligation not to do unnecessary harm to those capacities. And then thinking about what does harm mean and what does necessary mean in that context and reframing uh, maybe a traditional view of those. And to accept fundamentally that humans are also animals, and that puts us on a different sort of more level playing field, if you will, when we're talking about balancing the interests of human and non-human animals. And so in that way, hopefully we can reframe our relationships with and to animals, both within the law, across other disciplines, within the natural world, and that we can learn from traditional and other people's relationships with animals, all in an effort to look for ways to coexist in a mutually supportive way. So as Dr. King said, today our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. And that, we think, uh, applies to the conversation we've been having today. It's a challenge we've accepted, and we hope you'll join us in accepting. Our goal is to have healthy, sustainable ecosystems where animals can live naturally, and that's what we're working for. And we thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy and Amy, for this compelling and thorough presentation on aquaculture. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Stay tuned for more on-demand animal law CLE webinars from the Center for Animal Law Studies. Thank you.